after watching Donald Trump yesterday, and he did uh, Turning Point USA, a Dr. Phil interview and a David Sachs fundraiser yesterday on Arizona and the West Coast, and then I know where they taped Dr. Phil. Meanwhile, in Normandy, Joe Biden is looking awful and sounding worse next to Macron, who's jumping around like Donald Trump. It was a very good week for Donald Trump. What do you think? I think it was a very good week, and I also think that you know one of the things that is is interesting about this is, I mean, we saw sort of Joe Biden in the midst of of you know a number of, of veterans of D Day, you know these last surviving heroes who are all in their 90s or above 100, and he looked less fry than them. I mean, some of them really absolutely, was, you bet. And and I realize that they don't have the weight of the presidency on them. Uh, but the point is, you know, we don't we don't even need him to be as spry as Macron, but we'd like him, like him to be able to stand around and shake hands at least with these vets, uh, you know, as opposed to just having this this brief weird appearance and then, uh, you know, a speech that doesn't live up to the moment that looks more like it's aimed at domestic politics and then you know jet out of there as quickly as possible. And part of this to me is is a question too of how much this trial is weighing uh, of Hunter Biden is weighing on Joe himself. Um, because I do think that if one if one aspect of this uh, reporting about him is true, I think that it actually has jarred him. Uh, and, you know, it's something that has shown up in a couple of places in the media. I don't think he ever thought it would get to this point. And I've made the point that, you know, it never really should have come to trial. It, it should not have gone to trial, and Hunter could have avoided bringing it to trial. Um, but that's the hubris that Hunter Biden has displayed time and time again, uh, where he only cares about himself. Uh, they try to trick the case, judge. You can't try and trick a federal judge. I mean, it, yeah. it was crazy. All right, yeah, let, it, let's go, Ben, because it's a long list that they leaked yesterday yeah, of vice presidential candidates. I want to run down and get your reaction. First of all, age, I'm going to do it alphabetically. Age 67, the North Dakota governor, Doug Burgum, billionaire, successful businessman, Star Stanford Business School, unflappable, very easygoing, very smart. What do you think? I think he's a very safe choice. The only concern I have with Burgum is that he hasn't been put through the media ringer the way that some of these people who are, you know have been in the public eye in Washington, D.C. have. So how he stands up to that kind of pressure and uh, has to be kind of a warrior uh, throughout this process, which is what I think the vice presidential choice has to be, uh, is an, still an open question. But a very safe choice offends no one in the party. Senator Tom Cotton, age 47, he's been in Congress 12 years, four in the House, now eight in the Senate. He's on the Intel Committee, Judiciary Committee, former federal judicial clerk, also sixth, uh, Fifth Circuit clerk, and served in the 101st in Iraq, in the Old Guard at Arlington, and then to Afghanistan in counterterrorism operations. What do you think about Tom Cotton? I think he's got a fantastic resume. I think that the one question with him is whether he adds to your, to your coalition um, and, you know, look, I, I think the other thing is it's almost a waste to put him in that vice president in the sense that he looks to me a lot more like a cabinet choice uh, who could do some very effective work in a number of different roles uh, than maybe vice president. But I think that he would be a solid choice as well. And, and again, I don't think that there would be anybody uh, who would question it, given especially the fact that he has the kind of military experience that speaks to the moment. You know, there, there have been a series of cotton interviews on Meet the Press, Face the Nation, and This Week uh, sort of auditions. And I, he just lacerated every host he came up against. That is yeah. part of the calling card. Number three, this one surprised me, even though I like Dr. Ben quite a lot. He's a wonderful man, Dr. Ben Carson. But he's 72 years old. He was a fine housing and urban development secretary. He got a new book out. What do you think about this? I, I think that this is uh, just sort of a nod toward – uh, toward Carson in a way that's that's polite, but I don't think that he's getting serious consideration in large part because of his age. I do think that you know if he was younger, perhaps he would get you know higher consideration. And surely you know Donald Trump likes likes him and likes working with him, um, but I don't think that he's uh, the type of pick that is forward looking, which is what you want to be in terms of contrasting your ticket with Joe Biden. And if Donald Trump wants the party to remain his party. He's got to put forward someone who can really win exactly. the nomination, exactly. I think. Yeah. Uh, Byron Donald, age 45, Florida 19th. This seems to be a uh, that a boy to me. Well, I, well, I certainly think that uh, it, it sounds like that and seems like that. Uh, Donald is obviously, you know, a, a puncher when it comes to his television appearance. Way above his he's weight. He's very yep. green. And, uh, and I think that that's something that uh, is not is not a good contrast. I think you want someone really solid who who basically 
uh, can reassure people about the solidity of your ticket. Uh, and that's somebody that I don't think Donald is quite yet. But, you know, this, this list has on it three African-American men, right? And uh, Senator Tim Scott's coming up. And Byron Donald's is one of them. Do you think that that is intentional by Team Trump? To, you know, that that temptation is that he would really like to get the 20 or even higher percent among African-American look, men? Look, I think that this is another indication of the fact that Trump cares a lot more about winning over black uh, uh, African-American men in, uh, in America this cycle uh, because he believes he has a strong opportunity to do it. I think he wants to make that number a big number, and he understands the political damage that could do. All right, Senator Marco Rubio, Florida, age 53, chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And again, I always look at the intel committees in the House and the Senate because that's where all the most serious people go. Senator Rubio has been on that for a while. What do you think? Of course, that means Donald Trump would have to move to New Jersey and put up with the lawsuit stuff about eligibility because you cannot have both president and vice president from the same state. And it's not as easy to do as it was done with Dick Cheney in 2000. That that wrinkle, but for that wrinkle, I think that this would be the obvious choice. And one of the reasons is that I think that picking Rubio, one, I think it, it solidifies you with every Nikki Haley voter without actually having to pick Nikki Haley. But it also represents to me kind of a completion of the arc of Donald Trump taking over the leadership of this party and fully kind of embracing all the different coalitions. Uh, plus, it's it's forward looking. But, you know, again, Rubio has been around long enough. You can see the way that he's developed as a politician. He's adapted to this populist moment in a way that I think is healthy and intelligent, as opposed to just aping the language. Uh, and that's something that I think is encouraging. So how much of a problem would it be if Donald Trump said, well, I'm going to be a New Jersey citizen now. I've been in Bedminster. Every, no, everybody knows I'm a Bedminster guy. I'm in New York. Everybody knows it. Maybe he goes back to Trump Tower. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where we don't – this has never really been tested to the degree that, you know, it, uh, it probably ought to have been in the past. Uh, and so it would definitely be something to find out, and I'm yeah. sure that there would be – I have the answer when after. people bring it up, though, Ben. I'm going to put it out there, which is when people question if he goes back to New York, he says, well, I changed my residence given how much time these doggone prosecutors are making me stay here. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a great point. You. That, that's how you do it. All right, Senator um, Tim Scott, what do you think? You know, I've said before that I think Tim Scott's a very safe choice. And I think that, you know, it's somebody who uh, has uh, proven himself as both a fundraiser and a spokesman. The other thing is, uh, for some reason, I think that Tim Scott, and we see a little bit of this with Brian Redonald's, as we saw it this week, we see a little bit of it with Ben Carson. For some reason, Tim Scott, and, uh, and maybe it's because of where he's from in the South, he gets under liberal skin in a way that is shocking for a guy who's so nice. Yeah, that's true, but here's the interesting thing, Ben. I've known Tim forever, and he's a wonderful man. I thought he would run a much better campaign than he did. He he outrages Democrats, but does he connect with Republicans? Because that was a bad primary campaign. Yeah, that's. I think that's actually the second part of what I was going to say. I'm not sure that he inspires Republicans the way that some of the other choices on this list might. But the one thing that I would say to you is, just imagine the view talking about Tim Scott as a Republican uh, vice president oh. <laughs> for the next five months. It would be, it would, they'll go insane. <laughs> Two more, Elise Stefanik and J.D. Vance. And let's make sure we cover them both. Elise Stefanik is 39, J.D. Vance is 39. That's really turning the page uh, on the generational. Elise Stefanik representing New York One. J.D. from my home state of Ohio. He went to The Ohio State University, Yale Law School. Everybody knows Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, Elise, I've never actually interviewed her, although I don't know why. We're, she's on the Institute of Politics board where my buddy was running it. I, I, I just don't know her. I'll have to go and interview her. But what do you think of those two? Elise Stefanik, a, a, you know, a great, uh, hardworking Republican uh, you know, member. She's a good fundraiser. She's got a lot of uh, attributes to her. But again, I think that she's just a little too green for this moment. You might like the idea of the contrast with her and Kamala if they were debating, but that's one day. You know, it's not something necessarily that, that rings out. Uh, Vance, obviously, is probably the most openly ambitious guy on this list. And so I think if you pick him, you almost run the danger of him uh, sort of seeming like he's running for president as soon as he joins in, which is, I think, the one risk with him. Uh, it's, it's something that I think actually a lot of young conservatives like J.D. Vance. They like the fact that he has strong uh, policy opinions. They like the direction that he would take things. Uh, but that, I think, is a little bit of a risk. I think you don't want somebody who puts themselves ahead of the guy at the top.